Good morning. Let's pray and I'll begin with uh, Thank you. Very well. Father, you have said through your servant David, blessed be the Lord. For he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord's my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. And I am helped. My heart exalts. And with my song, I give thanks to him. Help us, O oh Lord, to see you and your goodness. And that we may sing to you, sing to you in all our, all our thoughts and in and, and, and all our ways. We ask, Lord, that you would also lead Doug as he guides us in worship. And we pray for uh, Steve Rodance as he brings forth uh, the intercession of the church. And we pray for our pastor to show us how to rejoice and to worship in Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Please stand for the call to worship. From Psalm 145, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Let us call upon our Lord as we would worship him this morning. Let's join in singing him 22B, all you that fear Jehovah's name. Yes. 
please be seated. Let's go before our Lord now as we would seek to praise him both and seek his presence among us. Well, let's pray. Our Lord and our God, our Father in heaven, who knows and sees and is able to do all things. For you are the God of all creation, who not only made it, but you rule over all that you have made. The eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of nothing made heaven and earth and all that is in them, and who likewise upholds and governs them by your eternal counsel and by your providence. For the sake of Christ, your Son, you are our God and our Father, on whom we rely so entirely that we have no doubt that you will provide us with all things necessary for soul and body, and further that you will make whatever evils you send upon us in this valley of tears turn to our advantage, for you are able to do it, being almighty God and willing, being a faithful Father, and as our faithful Father, you bid us come to you in prayer with every need, with all of our frailty, with all of our cares, knowing that you are our provider and that you care for us, and that you have called us to be your own. You know all of our trials. You know our frame that we are but dust. And yet you provide for us our daily needs, both in times of prosperity and in times of need. You grant us an assured trust for an unknown future that we cannot see. And yet you see it all together, knowing the end from the beginning. You have appointed us not to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And since you rule over all things, we can rejoice now that we will one day arrive safely at our everlasting inheritance. As you've written in your word, we are persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Oh, Lord, how wondrous you are, how faithful and true, how gracious and merciful. We cry out to you now this morning. Lead us, we pray, that we would see you more clearly, that we would know this wondrous salvation that you have accomplished on behalf of your people. And Lord, that we might worship you with joy and gladness and give to you all praise and honor and glory. We pray this now through Christ our Lord and for his sake. Amen. Please stand now and let's join together as we would pray that prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Second 
great commandment where Jesus, of course, has been asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he answers to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And he says that the second, which we're considering this morning, which is like it, is that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. So Jesus gives this as a summary of what's often called the second table of the law, the first four commandments relating directly to God and the second set of six is our relationship with people around us. So it could very well be stated that this one commandment, if you will, includes honor father and mother, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And it, of course, includes all the prohibitions and all of the requirements in thought, word, and deed of all these six commandments. And we can spend a great deal of time going through each of those and summarizing all of that, which is so nicely and succinctly put in the, in the phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are several different ways that one can think about the law of God and about Christian behavior. One is simply in terms of law and of ethics. I want to do the right thing. And here they are. Here are the right things. A second way a Christian can think about it is from a familial perspective. I want to do what's pleasing to my Father in heaven. And he's shown me the things that are pleasing to him. Another possibility is that I want to imitate my Lord and my Savior. I want to be like him. Now, of course, any of these approaches are perfectly valid. They're helpful in different ways at different times and to different people who tend to view things in different ways. I want us to think about it this morning. Think about this command that we shall love our neighbor as ourselves this morning from the imitation model, the idea that we want to be like Christ. We're to be like our Lord, which is in one sense a very brief summary of what sanctification is all about, is that we're made to resemble, to look like, to be the same as our Lord and our Savior. So how does Jesus behave with respect to this commandment? And I just have picked out a few examples of how he's related to others in his ministry while on earth. Think about the wedding at Cana, where you've got the wine has run out. The people throwing the party, of course, are going to be immensely embarrassed. He has no incentive whatsoever to do anything. In fact, his mother urges him to do something. And yet, he provides for them just a simple act of kindness, a provision for somebody else's need. Think of Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, the well-educated, a Pharisee, part of the Sanhedrin, a leader in his time who comes to him at night to ask simple questions. And now Jesus is teaching gently in a caring fashion, but he treats Nicodemus. He gives him the truth. He doesn't shy away from that. And yet in a very kind and gentle way, about when feeding the multitude, They've been walking for a long period of time. It's hot and dusty. The day has been long. Many people are hungry. He has compassion upon them. And he feeds them. Or the Samaritan woman at the well, mm -hmm. who's living in immorality, and yet and who's rejected by all of Jewish culture. She's Samaritan by all means. And yet he speaks to her as an equal, as a friend, as someone who matters. He, of course, points out some of the issues in her life in a gentle way, and yet in a truthful way, but out of care for her, not out of condemnation. Then we come to Peter and his denial of Jesus. Verbally, physically, he runs away. How does Jesus respond to that? He's quick to forgive someone, even someone very near to him and dear to him, what can be viewed as perhaps 
the worst possible betrayal by a close companion. We see Jesus teaching that he's the good shepherd who feeds his sheep physically and spiritually. He directs their path away from evil and from danger. He rescues them when they're in distress. He gives his life for his sheep. We're called to be imitators of our Lord. We call ourselves Christians. It's a title that was given many, many, many years ago. And why? Because they follow Christ. They're like Christ. Teaching, caring, protecting, guiding, giving, esteeming others more highly than ourselves. All of these things are a part of what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. So this, of course, is what our Lord is accomplishing in the lives of each of his children as we grow in grace and power and sanctification. So the question that I would ask is, how are we doing? Let's take a few moments just to silently consider our own condition, and then we'll go to our Lord as we would pray the corporate confession. So let's just take a few moments. Let's join together now with the corporate confession that you'll find printed in your bulletin. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their sins. Restore those who are penitent. According to your promises, declare to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And hear this very simple declaration of pardon from First John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Good news. <laughs> Father God, how can we say anything but thank you? Thank you for the life you have given each of us. We come before you with grateful hearts, praising you for who you are, knowing that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We recognize those good things, both large and small, with which you have blessed us. You alone are worthy of our praise and thanksgiving. Lord, forgive us when we fail or forget to give you thanks as we ought. We pray we may always have thankfulness in our hearts to you as the word of Christ dwells in us richly, as we teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, as we sing psalms and hymns with thankfulness. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Father, that George Doran is home from the hospital. We are thankful that the doctors were able to work out a good treatment plan. Bless George with good recovery and Lynn as she ministers to her husband. We lift up Deb nicely, sister-in-law Karen, who has suffered great loss in the past year and is now sick in the hospital. Please heal this woman of faith as she looks to you for strength. Please also be with Deb's colleague and her husband as he is in serious condition following a snowmobile accident. First and foremost, we pray for their salvation as they navigate this serious situation. Be with sons, Michael and Terry. Yield this man to your glory, we pray. 
We pray for God's faithfulness over A. Powell's health situation, yes, yes. which is still serious. We pray for Sharon Souza, who suffered a fall and a broken shoulder. Please provide the best care for Sharon and bless Lorraine Bailey and others as they minister mm -hmm. to our sister in Christ. Mary Tauger's family member David is in the hospital with trouble breathing. Mm -hmm. Please heal him according to your will, Lord. We pray for Ernie's friend, Don Woody, who is heavily involved with children's ministries to the poorest of the poor in our country and has been in the hospital since Tuesday with COVID. We pray for a speedy recovery so he can get back to his ministry. We pray for Badi Bakum, faithful minister of your word, mm -hmm. suffering from serious heart disease. Please heal this soldier of Christ that he may continue to serve you here on earth, Lord. Lord, please continue to minister to the families that lost homes due to the fire in Raymond. Mm -hmm. We pray that you'll provide beyond measure and your name would be glorified in this tragic situation. Please be with the Levitt's son, Ben, and his wife, Emily, along with countless elders in the state of Texas, suffering from the effects of severe weather and loss of power. We lift up to Fernie's children, Mike and his family, whose home was destroyed by water after his pipes rose. We pray for Heather and, and her situation. We pray for the homeless in the Dallas area and throughout that they may be cared for during the crisis. Please provide for all affected, both physically and spiritually, to your everlasting glory. We pray for Romanian Christian enterprises in Arad, Romania. We pray for good health to those who have been sick, for their schools, for special needs students, for legal issues with the local government mm -hmm. and other ministries to the people in their community. We pray for the Guild Arts with MPW. We echo their request that the government will not alter laws affecting freedom to worship. Yes. And that God would continue to bless the people of France through the witness of French evangelical churches. Please be with a single mom who needs a job and housing, but is finding it especially difficult due to the economy. Remember your promise, Lord, to provide for widows and orphans. Please provide for this woman in a big way. We praise you along with the Guild Arts that the MTW ministry has flourished despite these difficult days. Satoshi and, and Kelly Kawashi request prayer for their ministry. We pray that they would be able to get to know the neighbors better and be a good witness to Christ. We lift up an upcoming hike for companionship in the Lord. Bless Kelly's ministry and her health. Mm -hmm. Be with daughters Sophie and Susie we pray for good health and guidance in continuing education. Mm -hmm. Father, now we ask now that you be with our pastor as he reads your word and explains it to us. Help him deliver your message to us and help us understand it and take it in. Your word states, whoever tends a fig tree will eat its fruit. Mm -hmm. Lord, help us to be ever in your word and take in the sweet fruit of your truth. In Christ's name we pray. <laughs> we turn to our Old Testament passage in Proverbs 29. Almost finished the book of Proverbs, a couple more weeks after this. Hard to imagine that we've actually gone through that, but here we are at chapter 29. And it begins, he who is often reproved, yet stiffens his neck, will suddenly be broken beyond healing. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. He who loves wisdom makes his father glad, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. By justice, a king builds up the land, but he who exacts gifts tears it down. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. An evil man is ensnared in his transgression, but a righteous man sings and rejoices. A righteous man knows the rights of the poor, a wicked man does not understand such knowledge. 
Scoffers set a city aflame, but the wise turn away wrath. If a wise man has an argument with a fool, the fool only rages and laughs and there's no quiet. Bloodthirsty men hate one who is blameless and seek the life of the upright. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. If a ruler listens to falsehood, all his officials will be wicked. The poor man and the oppressor meet together. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. If a king faithfully judges the poor, his throne will be established forever. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. When the wicked increase, transgression increases, but the righteous will look upon their downfall. Discipline your son, and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. By mere words, a servant is not disciplined. For though he understands, he will not respond. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Whoever pampers his servant from childhood will in the end find him as heir. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. The partner of a thief hates his own life. He hears the curse, but discloses nothing. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Many seek the face of a ruler, but it is from the Lord that a man gets justice. An unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, but one whose way is straight is an abomination to the wicked. Before we go on to Matthew's gospel, I just want to say how much I really appreciated not only to read Proverbs in the morning, but then to study it some in the afternoon and then to preach on it on Sunday evening. Because there's so much in this book that there's just no way, you know, you, you almost feel like you're cheating just reading through a chapter. You have to stop at every point along the way. So tonight we're going to focus on all of the information that we receive in Proverbs 29 um, on the righteous person. That's one way to look at this from the standpoint of the righteous person. What, what, what's the instruction here given to the righteous? Okay, now we're continuing again in Matthew's gospel. We're a very short passage, but fits in perfectly with our Isaiah passage it's about the healing of Jesus. And it's uh, Matthew 8, 14 through 17, one of the earliest healings that takes place. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. And then continuing in Paul's letters, we're on Ephesians 2 here today. It's a, a familiar passage. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, who were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him 
and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the spirit. Great passage. Huh? Our passage this morning, though, that we're looking at is in Isaiah 38. If you'll stand, we'll continue with the story of Hezekiah. And really, I think today's story of who is this God who answers prayer? Isaiah 38. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah, the prophet, son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order. For you shall die. You shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, prayed to the Lord, and said, Please, O Lord, remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and will defend this city. This shall be the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he has promised. Behold, I will make the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz turn back 10 steps. So, so the sun turned back on the dial, the 10 steps by which it had declined. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness, I said, in the middle of my days, I must depart. I am consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, the Lord in the land of the living. I shall look on man no more among the inhabitants of the world. My dwelling is plucked up and removed from me like a shepherd's tent. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life. He cuts me off from the loom. From day to night, you bring me to an end. I calm myself until morning like a lion. He breaks all my bones. From day to night, you bring me to an end. Like a swallow or a crane, I chirp. I moan like a dove. My eyes are weary with looking upward. Oh, Lord, I am oppressed. Be my pledge of safety. What shall I say 
for he has spoken to me and he himself has done it. I walk slowly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live and in all these is the life of my spirit. Oh, restore me to health and make me live. Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. But in love, you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol does not thank you. Death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living he thanks you as I do this day. The Father makes known to the children your faithfulness. The Lord will save me, and we will play my music on stringed instruments all the days of our lives at the house of the Lord. Now Isaiah had said, let them take a cake of figs and apply it to the boil that he may recover. Hezekiah also had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Please be seated. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. With many trials in this life, and even though our outer nature is wasting away, we're told in the scriptures, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. And uh, we're told that what we face now is a light momentary affliction, preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. But sometimes the affliction does not seem at all light. And sometimes we're the one that survives and someone else is not here, and that doesn't feel light either. In fact, there are many, many trials in this world. You look around and try to think about, well, who, who's missed trials? No, in, in this world, you will have tribulation. But Jesus says, be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. And I, I want to talk about the Jesus who has overcome the world today, using this passage here in Isaiah uh, 38. Let's start by looking at uh, Hezekiah's situation, it's a sickness unto death. It's, it says here it's a boil. The Hebrew word has to do with inflammation. And in ancient Egypt, uh, this, this word was also used to talk about the disease of elephantiasis. So it's, it's anything that involves a swelling. So inflammation that would have been accompanied by all the sort of things that that might cause it. Could have, could have been from an insect. It could have been from lots of different things, a parasite of some kind. But what we do know is that he was at the point of death. So it was that serious. In fact, God sent Isaiah, who's an ambassador of the Lord, bringing the word of God to Hezekiah. And he tells him very firmly, set your house in order, right? Get ready because you shall die. You shall die. Sounds very definite. And then just to reinforce, you shall not recover. I would think that what he's supposed to do now is just calmly take this. So, Lord, you know best, you know. It's not what he does at all. It's not what he does. And some of this may just depend on the person, the situation, what exactly God causes to well up within a person. Because, you know, the Lord who knows all things actually knew that Hezekiah was going to live. Of course, you know, he knows these things. Just as he knew that Israel would be brought through the wilderness and that the next generation would go into the promised land. Yet remember what he said to Moses, stand away from the congregation so that I could destroy them and I'll make a new nation out of you. What does Moses do? Well, he does what Hezekiah does here. He pleads before God. He weeps. He prays. And God brings out in his servant, a spirit of intercession to plead for something here. In this case, it's Hezekiah pleading for his own life. It might, we might think, well, I wouldn't do that. Of course, we haven't been probably in exactly the same situation. We don't know what we'll do at that point. So we learn over the course of life to not make proud pronouncements about things like that, to just to actually face the things that we face and ask for God's grace to go through it. Well, this is what Hezekiah does. He, he, he turns his face to the wall. I don't know what wall it was exactly, but it was just in his own house. If he was that sick and prayed to the Lord and prayed to the Lord, please, oh Lord, remember how I've walked before you in faithfulness. Now, this is not necessarily the best uh, 
thing for us to plead before the Lord, our own faithfulness. But it's what Hezekiah does. And again, we don't, we don't know what we'd say. We might, we might often make a prayer based on God's own faithfulness, on God's name, on God's promises, and leave it all in his hands. But he says, no, I've walked before you in faithfulness. Maybe we need to hear it, that he said this. And with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. I found myself as I was going through this, just thinking about Hezekiah, it says he wept bitterly, thinking about him in a new way. Think about, about him maybe as a simple man. He became king. You no know, people became king because they were descendants of, of the man who was king. And for all kinds of reasons that they're chosen to be the next one to go. And maybe, maybe he was a very simple man in a way. He was the kind of man that said, well, God said this is the way it's supposed to be, and that's what we're going to do. That kind of simple is amazing sometimes to us. We're so sophisticated. We find ways of disagreeing with God and going our own way when we, maybe what we just need to do is be like Hezekiah. Maybe he was a faithful king, actually, in what he did. Amazing. His son, his son wasn't at all. He's one of the worst of the kings. So Hezekiah weeps bitterly, and we wonder to ourselves, we don't have to wonder for long, what, what, is, what is God going to do here? And the word comes back through the same Isaiah, you know, the same spokesman just had just said, nothing's going to change here, you're going to die. And all of a sudden, go say to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Imagine that. God is moved by prayer. It seems like he's even brought about situations like this in the Bible, many situations, so that we would realize that the God who knows everything, who's in charge of everything, actually hears prayers. He's got that as part of his plan. And even the way he's moved by prayer is part of his plan. Your words, your tears actually make a difference to God. Behold, I added 15 years to your life. That's not only good news for Hezekiah. It's actually good news for Israel. Hezekiah was not a perfect man. You can read more about this in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. And you get more of the full picture. You know, every, every once in a while, the word pride shows up. I guess it does in our lives, too. Uh, we, we turn out to be not perfect as well. Um, and we, we look and see more of the story of Hezekiah, so it's not all pretty. But the way Isaiah tells it here now, it's, it's not criticizing. He's not criticizing Hezekiah in this chapter. Don't you agree? I'm kind of surprised. I look at the study Bible, and they're criticizing Hezekiah. Well, Isaiah didn't, so maybe we should just let it be. Here, this is what he was, right? And what we see is that there is not only the Lord assuring him here, that he'll have 15 years, which will be good news for Israel, because it's, it's not easy to have a good king. And Manasseh is not going to be a good, good king, his son. So I will deliver you in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. We'll defend this city, because even though the Assyrians have gone away, we don't know exactly how to place this episode here, but let's just say it's right in order as it's written, that the Assyrians had gone away, yet they would still be quite a threat. You know, to anybody who would be thinking about their the position of Israel, and you think about how dangerous, and here's the assurance. I'm gonna I'm gonna deliver you out of this, out of the hand of the king of Assyria. I'll defend this city. That's good news. So not only do we have this verbal assurance, but then a sign is given. And we read in 2 Kings that it, there was a choice. Do you want the dial to go the normal way? Um, 10 steps forward, uh, 10 degrees, think about it that way. Or do you want it to go the other way? You know, go backwards. Hezekiah, like I said, I think he's a simple man in some ways. He said, yeah, usually it would go forward. Let's do backward. Because <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be better for my soul, you know, to be able to see. If I see that, then I'll really have more assurance that, yeah, this is how it's going to work. And it said the sun turned back on the dial, the 10 steps by which it had declined. Somebody was mentioning to me this morning that so person had done an amazing sort of scientific analysis of time and over the centuries and 
they worked everything out and it was just off a little bit they're looking at the bible and different things that had happened the sun standing still and so forth and it all seemed to work out just a little bit off they said oh yeah that's right what about hezekiah and and that was the little bit they needed i don't know but that's kind of fascinating to think about you know that god has everything very much in hand this is not mythology this actually happened with a real man who warts and all was a pretty good king as kings go he really was and he was in trouble he was about to die and he cried out to god he wanted to live he wanted to live and uh, the lord gave him life so now then the rest of the passage is, is a writing of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. So let's look at that, because it was his response to everything that had taken place. Uh, and it said, verse 13, like a lion, he breaks all my bones. From day to night, you bring me to an end. So he's describing in this writing how he felt as he was going through this difficulty. Verse 14, O Lord, I am oppressed. Be my pledge of safety. So we're given more content to what his prayers were through this writing that he kept. What shall I say? For he has spoken to me and he himself has done it. You know, here he is debating with himself. Hezekiah, what are you thinking of? The man said, this is going to happen. What shall, look, God is going to do this, but I still don't like it. You know, they're still fighting in prayer. Oh Lord, restore me to hell and make me live. See, I can relate to this. I bet you can too, right? When you really have something that you just brought before the Lord. And, uh, and I recognize sometimes we'll do this with the most earnest prayer and still things don't happen the way that we like. I understand that. The mystery of providence to me is inscrutable. I look at certain people that seem to go through health difficulty after health difficulty in life, and I cannot fathom what it is all about. It is not as if that... You know, you could look at their life and say, oh, no, and see, this person is being punished. That's not it at all. I look at the distribution of providence, and I cannot figure it out. Can you? It's inscrutable. All right? So, yet he comes to a marvelous conclusion in verse 17 that he puts into his song or his writing here. He says, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. Now that's, that's insightful, really. He had come to see that even his crying out with bitterness, and he admits, I was bitter. When I considered my life and considered what was happening, that I, my life was being taken away in the middle, and I wanted it to last to the end. How could this be? That he had a bitterness in him, and he said, even that was somehow in God's plan and was for my good. I mean, this is Romans 8. That God's working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But it's not like we understand it all or we're able to sort it out. I certainly cannot. But he says, in love you have delivered me. And see, this is something that you and I need to hold on to. That the future ahead of us is glorious. And nothing is going to take that away. And when we're in the midst of that glory, that we'll be able to say, behold, it was for my welfare, even that I had great bitterness. But in love, you've delivered me. You've delivered my life from the pit of destruction. For you've cast all my sins behind your back. And through Jesus, that's exactly what's happened. God has cast all of our sins behind his back. And so the land of the dead called here Sheol does not thank you, right? Say, so look, at, I could have gone down to the land of the dead, but that's, you know, the grave is not a place of great worship. It's not. Death does not praise you. What is Hezekiah saying? He's saying over, over and over again, the living, the living. We are made for life. And what do we have in heaven? Is it death? No, it's life where you live, that's where you look back and say, even what I had before was barely light compared to this. I don't know how much Hezekiah even understands that at this point. He wants to live. He wants to praise God. 
And uh, he says to the living, the living, he thanks you, as I do today. This living person is the one who thanks you. And I, I thank you today. That's why I'm writing these words here today. And then he says an amazing verse that I'd love us to focus on. The Lord will save me. And we, not I, but we, will play my music. Now, I don't think Hezekiah had, a, had some LPs, you know. He just said, let's go to our, my, my place. We'll play my music. No, it's music he's made up. He's a composer. You know, he's put together songs. He sings. Like it says in, in uh, Proverbs that we just read. What was it? It said, um, a righteous man sings and rejoices. And Hezekiah was the righteous man he sung. He liked to sing to the Lord. And so he's saying here, the Lord will save me and we will play my music on stringed instruments all the days of our lives at the house of the Lord. That sounds like eternity, but he's really just even talking about now. I've got these 15 years, let's use it, playing uh, musical instruments. Now it turns out that we might have the best intentions of doing just that thing, and, and um, then we fall back into some of our other patterns and the other things that interest us most. Uh, end up taking over, and we read a little bit about that in Second Chronicles, that this happened with Hezekiah, that he forgot a little bit about what he had promised to do, and then we have next chapter, that'll be next week, next week to think about that, and the Babylonian envoys and so forth, so it just ends, it tells us, you know, a few extra facts just to put it all together, about Isaiah was the one who told him what to do about this inflammation, and it went away, and, and about the, how Isaiah had asked him for that sign, and now, here's the thing. Um, larger catechism and shorter catechism both start in the same place. What is the chief end of man, right? Why are we here? Why was I born? Why were you born, right? A larger catechism says, what's the chief and highest end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to, larger catechism says, fully, fully enjoy him forever. So that's, that's basically the exact same message, shorter catechism, larger catechism. It's where they start Say, look, you'll never be able to make sense out of life unless you know this is number one. This is why you're here, to glorify God and to fully enjoy him. This is your chief and highest purpose in life, is to do that. That's why you were created, to worship God. And in Romans 11, we, we, we read that from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Um, and in 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Corinthians 10, we learn more about giving glory to God. And uh, we read about the fact that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You know that that everything is really about glory. It says you were bought for by a, uh, you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So that's kind of the backup that the Westminster Assembly used to justify this. That this is the first and most important thing in your life, whether you're sick or whether you're well, you know, whether you're abasing or abounding, whatever it may be. Whether you seem to have nothing, you seem to have everything. Your whole life is for the worship of Almighty God. And I want to further introduce you to the God who hears and answers prayer so that you could more and more glorify and enjoy him. Because the more we see God for who he really is, then the more your chief and highest end becomes possible in the worst times and the best times. See, because God has created us. He's not only created us, though. He's ordained the struggles that we've had. He's provoked the prayers within us. He's granted us deliverance. And it's all to the purpose that we should worship him forever, not just here in this life, but eternally. I come that they might have life. I have it abundantly. And it's, it's such a worthy purpose. So Jesus now, if I can introduce you to Jesus, then I can introduce you to the God who hears and answers prayer. And the more that you see Jesus, 
that you have seen God, right? Isn't that what he says? How can you say, show to me the Father? If you see me, you have seen the Father because Jesus is the visible representation of the invisible God. So let's apply this as just realizing first that Jesus, Jesus faced the trial of all trials. Here was Hezekiah. He had an inflammation. It was deadly. He was going to die. Jesus faced the trial of all trials. And he gave glory to his father in the way that he did it. We have all, we have all these accounts in the four gospels that show us how did he conduct himself in the midst of this trial? And it's nothing like it. It's so real and just so honoring of his father. There's just no sin in it at all. It's so beautiful. And because of what Jesus did in that trial of all trials, the church has been singing ever since that point, And we're going to sing forever because of that. So five quick thoughts as we close here. One, worship the Jesus of creation. The Jesus of creation. Because John 1, 3 says all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. So that the Jesus that you would turn to is the Jesus who's responsible for everything that's been made. And then two, worship the Jesus of God-ordained struggles because God-ordained struggles are a part of the providence, the mysterious providence that this Jesus is utterly in charge of. This Jesus who went to the cross for you. Hebrews 5 eight says he himself faced this. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Talk about not understanding something. I have a hard time understanding it. How does Jesus learn obedience? He who never sins at all. Yet it was somehow through suffering, through what he suffered. And he knew that. And so he knows to your situation and condition. Worship Jesus, of the Jesus of God ordained struggles. Number three, worship the Jesus of earnest prayer. And we read in Luke 22, 44, about the earnest prayer with which he approached his father in the garden of Gethsemane. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. See, you might think, well, how can anybody be more earnest than Hezekiah in his prayer? Jesus was. It says his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus knew earnest prayer, and he's the one who intercedes for you. So know him and worship him. And fourthly, worship the Jesus of divine rescue. Think of Peter's mother-in-law there. Just lifts her up and she serves. Or this one I love, love these words, Talitha Kumi, right? To that girl, that little girl, which little girl I say to you, arise. And she's able to get up. So whether young or old, man or woman, uh, whoever that person may be, whatever the struggle is, that God is the God, not only who's ordained struggle and who brings out earnest prayer, even from his son, that this Jesus is also the Jesus of rescue, divine rescue. And he will not leave you with an unsatisfying book of life where you come to the end of that book and say, that's the conclusion of the book. You're kidding me. It ended that way. That's not what you're going to be saying. When you see the grand culmination of what this Jesus can and will do, what his commitment is, you, you know what you're going to say? Glory to God. It's what you're going to say. You're going to say, this is why I was born, to worship this God. This is why I live. And I went through some things, but nothing can compare to the glory that I see right now in front of me. It was very much all worth it, very much. I just couldn't see it before, but now I see with my eyes the truth, and I bow before him and finally worship the Jesus of eternal life. Revelation 1 says, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He said, I'm the first and the last. Sometimes uh, somewhere in the middle, we get confused. We're, we're in the middle of everything. And we look and say, Lord, what in the world? But 
Fear not. He's actually working within us as we bring the honest prayer before him, earnest prayer. He'll deliver you. He'll help you, if, even if you don't see it in the way that your eyes really were desperate to want to see. Just know it's there. God has promised you he will not lie. He is true. And one day he'll say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed be his Son who died for my sins. Blessed be his glorious name forever. And blessed be the spirit of power that has claimed me for God. Let us pray. So, Father, thank you for what you did in the life of this great king, Hezekiah. Thank you for your great engagement in the life of your only begotten son, Jesus. And thank you that we have the privilege now of honoring and adoring you forever and ever. So, Lord, we give ourselves entirely to you. Though we recognize that you move in mysterious ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand now. Hymn 256 God moves in a mysterious way. <laughs> creed you know the promises of god are so good and people have been able to confess them before us so from the year 325 we have this nicene creed let's say it together we believe in one god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth of all things visible and invisible and in one lord jesus christ the only begotten son of god begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, 
whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. So we come to the Lord's table now, and we're just going through Matthew 26, the very next passage. It says, in going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Isn't that great? In terms of what we've been thinking about, there's not only the earnest plea that's brought out by the Son of God, but also the complete faith and trust of the Son of God and His Father. There's nothing sinful in that. There's everything that's right. Everything that's right. And of course, the same God who knows the beginning from the end in the days of Moses and in the days of Hezekiah, uh, and in our day too, that same God knows the beginning from the end, regarding what was happening to Jesus. He would give his body for us. He would shed his blood for our transgressions. And now we here today worship God through Jesus as our mediator. We receive from him these good gifts that he has for us. And we take these in now. We take in the bread and we take in the cup, but somehow we're taking in more than that too that Christ is spiritually present here with us as we partake of the elements here today. And we need this. We need to be able to, uh, to take in these elements and to be able to say, yes, I'm a part of the, of the body of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. I'm a part of something that God knew from before the foundation of the world. And I'm a, a part of something that will never, ever fade away. So with that assurance and that confidence, if, if you have believed in Christ and professed faith in him in order to be a part of this or some other congregation, if you've been admitted to the table of the Lord, then partake of this food here today with that confidence and assurance, not in your own goodness, far from it. That would be a, that would be a very shaky foundation for us. So, Yes, we want to be faithful. We'd like to be able to say with Isaiah, Lord, remember me, I've been faithful. We would like to be able to say that too. I hope we can. But we have a better plea to Lord, your son, who's been faithful to the end. And he went, he went forward and he did what he had to do. So we're able to partake here today. If this is not true of you, that you have not yet actually bowed the knee to Jesus, I just want to urge you to do so. There's no better day than today. Today is a day of salvation for us right now. So each time we gather together on the first day of the week, it's a good day for us to bow the knee to Christ. And that's true for all of us as we've done that before. To, again, to say, yeah, yes, Lord, again, I, I bow the knee to you. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for the means of grace that you've given to your church that we're able to read the scriptures and to preach the word and to hear the word preached. We thank you, Lord God, that we're able to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with joy in our hearts to you. We thank you for the blessing of being a part of a communing of faith, a community of, of, of faith, hope, and love. And we thank you for baptism, for our baptism we remember uh, oh, Lord God, that we've been marked with the waters of baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You've claimed us as your own. And we thank you for the gift of faith by the Holy Spirit that you've granted to us. And we, we thank you for this supper, then, as we would partake of this food here in accordance with your holy instruction to your church. Please bless, then, this sacrament for 
our well-being and for the good of all your children and for the glory of your name. For that is why we live, Father, to glorify you and to enjoy you fully forever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> I just want to encourage you as you would prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, encourage you with the words of the hymn we're about to sing. No matter who you are, you probably came in here today with some measure of trial on your heart. Something is on your mind, on your soul. It's hard, hard to shake it off. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off your guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands, my name is written on his hands. He ever lives above for me to intercede, his all-redeeming love, his precious blood to plead. His blood atoned for every race and sprinkles now the throne of grace. Five bleeding wounds he bears received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers, they strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry, nor let that ransom sinner die. My God is reconciled. His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me for his child. I can no longer fear. With confidence I now draw nigh. With confidence I now draw nigh. And Father, Abba, Father, cry. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. Oh, Lord, our God, you have given us everything we need, and we thank you for the, the cup. The, we thank you for the blood of the lamb. We thank you for this communion cup, the fruit of the vine. And now we, we here together are one with people all over the earth, from Jew and Gentile. The dividing wall of hostility is down. Now we have one body of Christ from every people group. Thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. Oh, Lord God, 
It is a delight to be in your presence. It's a joy, Lord, to know you, to open up your word, to, to hear the truth. Oh, Lord, we trust you. We, we surrender yet again today to you. Have your way in our lives and help us to, to have souls that recognize that our sins are forgiven and to give our lives to you as our Abba Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's uh, sing together now our closing hymn, 275, Arise, My Soul, Arise. and communion of the Holy Spirit abide and be with you both now and forever and all God's people say. Amen. Amen.